You're listening to Making the Cut, the mostly true life story of a retired surgeon from 1C Productions. Hi, I'm Rebecca Seitz, founder and president of 1C Productions. This episode contains explicit language and adult content. It is intended for mature audiences only. Because of the childhood wounds from my father, I failed to engage in a mentor relationship with Professor Pilcher to the extent it was offered. The truly educational and encouraging experience with him left me hopeful about the future. That, however, was about to change with the introduction of Mr. Hart. With one week left in my locum, Mr. Hart became the acting head of the unit. In one week, I would revert to my lowly student status. I would lose the surgical house officer's privileges of carrying a pager, sleeping in a cozy bed, being served tea in the morning and a free dinner at night. I would miss what I enjoyed most, my raison d'être. The trappings of responsibility and privilege that accompanied the title of surgical HO. Mr. Hart was probably in his late forties, with fair, thinning hair, which he continually brushed off his forehead, revealing engaging blue eyes that added to his boyish good looks. He was of medium height and walked with a slight limp, which became more noticeable by the end of the day. He seemed friendly, was approachable to his patients, and enjoyed having students about him as he loved taking every opportunity to teach at the bedside or while operating. His acquired specialty after general surgery was vascular. Curiously, though, his junior registrars and the HO tended to avoid operating with him. Instead, they assigned students to him. I wondered why. Our first case together was a pneumonectomy, a left lung removal in a farmer admitted with extensive chronic necrotizing aspergillosis, an unusual fungal infection that failed to respond to medical treatment. We speculated that he had contracted it from dealing with hay. Although it was the same surgical team in theaters with Professor Pilcher, the surgeon today was Mr. Hart. I was the only assistant. We encountered a great deal of bleeding from adhesions of the diseased lung attacking the chest wall. Mr. Hart had to scrape the necrotic lung tissue off the diaphragm, the thin bellow that separated the chest from the abdominal cavity. Wherever Mr. Hart touched the tissue, it bled. Despite the chronic oozing, we managed to control it using pressure pads and electrocoagulation, though it never entirely stopped. All bleeding eventually stops. Unlike Professor Pilcher, Mr. Hart constantly chatted away, making it difficult for me to concentrate on my tasks. Suddenly he looked up at me. Did you see Darling with Julie Christie? Wasn't she gorgeous? I will earn an award for Best Actress, don't you think? Yes, she's a heartthrob. Wasn't her role as Lara in Dr. Zhivago magnificent? He's Egyptian, like you. Yes, I took the remark as a compliment. What keeps the diaphragm alive? What do you mean? Didn't you learn anatomy across Gower Street? Yes. Well, what nerves innervate the diaphragm? Oh, I see. You mean nerve 345 keeps the diaphragm alive? That's right. That's the reason you did so much anatomy and learned mnemonics. I nodded. He removed the entire dark greenish diseased lung. It looked worse than any cancerous tissue I had previously seen. It smelled putrid. We placed underwater seals in a suction drain to allow the remaining chest to expand. I helped close the long incision of the chest wall wound and, as before, 
found it tedious. I was tired. We dressed the wound. After five hours in the recovery room, the bleeding had almost stopped, though a persistent trickle came out of the drain, more than I was accustomed to seeing in Professor Pilcher's post-operative patients. Before he went home, Mr. Hart and I checked the patient, who by this point had been moved to a modified room. A specialized nurse fussed over the patient as we stood together opposite her. He was awake and physiologically stable, but had continued to ooze into the drain from his chest. Give him a unit of blood. He turned to me. Keep an eye on him. I had one week left to use the lift with impunity, given my elevated status of locum house officer. I descended to the ward from the top floor and started to admit the new patients, which took several hours. By late afternoon, the theta nurse paged me. Can we give your patient another unit of blood? With my admissions taken care of, I rode up to check on him. The patient sat propped up in bed, but, to my dismay, he looked pale and continued to lose a significant amount of blood from his chest into the drain. My experience as a surgeon was limited. As I was hanging the patient's fifth unit, Mr. Hart entered. Why haven't you telephoned me? Can't you see he's actively bleeding? There's no use giving him more blood, is there? You should have called me. He needs reoperating to tie off some fucking bleeder. He was right, of course. Not knowing better, I had been negligent. Had I been lulled into a false sense of security by the dictum that all bleeding eventually stops? Suddenly I grasped that he must have meant it sarcastically, and not in the way I understood it. In either case, the patient needed the fifth unit merely to keep his blood volume and prevent him from developing other complications, such as cardiac or renal failure. Mr. Hart declared an emergency, clearing the way ahead of other cases to be the first to go to an open operating room. By 8 p.m. and without dinner, we operated again. Counter to our expectation of finding one major bleeding source, we found many small bleeding points on the inside of the chest wall, consistent with the inflammatory process. We electrocoagulated these sites extensively for over an hour, such that the inner chest lining looked charcoal. Indeed, my face and hair smelled as if I had been to a barbecue. We left a much drier operative field the second time around. We closed the patient's chest and, about 11 p.m., Returned him to the makeshift recovery room with minimal oozing. It was another late night. On my way through the tunnel to my sleeping quarters, I wondered, why were there so many small bleeding points? We have two pleuras, the parietal, which lines the chest wall, and the visceral, which covers the lung. This allows the lung to slide over the chest wall with each breath. The farmer's fungal infection caused them to fuse extensively. First, we had to peel the lung's lining, the visceral pleura, from the parietal pleura, leaving the area raw and oozing. Second, during the operation, the anesthetic agents lowered the patient's usual blood pressure. Major bleeders are visible and can be taken care of, but not so with capillary bleeders or bleeding from raw areas. Postoperatively, the blood pressure normalized, at which point these raw areas started to bleed. Ultimately, the surgeon is responsible for a patient's welfare. I had witnessed an error in judgment in Mr. Hart's acceptance of the amount of oozing blood. Also, though, an error in management in waiting before reoperating occurred. I was partly to blame since I became absorbed with admissions and forgot to frequently check during the critical post-operative period. My take-home messages were, leave the operative field dry. In surgery, bleeding never resolves itself spontaneously. <laughs>
Mr. Hart was delighted to have me around and went out of his way to instruct and teach me, remembering that I was only an acting H.O., returning to lowly medical student status within a week. I wanted to admire him as I had Professor Pilcher and my father. He had an air of silent bewilderment, though. At first I took that to be a sign of scholarly thoughtfulness. As the week went by and I worked more consistently with him, I began to see his hesitancy to handle complex surgical conditions. I anxiously wondered if he was less experienced than his academic position suggested, worrying that one day I too might be in a situation beyond my operative capabilities. Knowing that Professor Pilcher would retire and that probably Mr. Hart would be the new chief at the time I would graduate in two years, I determined to cement a bond between us during this locum. When Mr. Hart looked up from the wound during every operation while I was his locum, it would be my face that he would see, my voice he would hear, and my assistance that he would receive. If I could become his H.O. on graduating, it would launch my surgical academic career beyond my wildest dreams. I had to become accustomed to Mr. Hart's constant nervous nattering, masking the lack of what medical students sought in senior surgeons, silent confidence. He also occasionally made snide and unnecessarily demeaning remarks to the younger nurses when they made a mistake. Senior nurses and medical students were visibly missing from his cases. Late one afternoon, I accompanied Mr. Hart to an in-house surgical consultation on the medical ward. A 54-year-old man presented with several weeks of constipation, although he could pass gas, indicative of incomplete large bowel obstruction. After establishing his basic history, we examined the bloated abdomen and reviewed a recent barium enema x-ray. The patient had a long partial narrowing, a three-inch segment, of his right colon extending to the transverse colon. The large bowel lies in the abdomen like an inverted letter U. It starts where the small bowel connects with the appendix in the abdomen's lower right-hand corner. The right colon sweeps upward to the liver, across to the patient's left side as the transverse colon, and descends as the left colon to the lower left side. The tumor must have been a long-standing, slow-growing cancer, partially constricting the gut wall, an obstruction akin to a dam. The effect was to distend the lumen upstream of the right colon. In it, there were several impressive cannonball-sized fecaliths, round masses of feces. Beyond the cancer, the downstream lumen was collapsed, small in diameter, and empty of fecal material. We need to operate, Mr. Jones. You're almost completely obstructed. That's very dangerous. You'll be transferred to the surgical ward where we can prepare you for surgery. I and Mr. Megid here will operate on you and relieve your obstruction. When you wake up, you may have a bag, you know, a colostomy bag. But it's highly unlikely. Sister will tell you all about colostomies, just in case I'll have to fashion one. I plan to operate on you on tomorrow morning, say, around 11am. So tell the wife about that. After dinner, I read in my favourite textbook, Abdominal Operations by Rodney Mangot, that given the extent of the tumour growth and its likelihood of developing a complete obstruction, an emergency right hemicolectomy was indicated to remove the cancer and the accumulated fecaliths the size of which brought to mind elephant dung. This meant that the surgeon's mindset ought rightly to be one of emergency operation, but Mr. Hart had said elective operation. I wondered why. The text noted the imminent threat of a complete blockage which would compromise the bowel's blood supply and lead to perforation with spillage of stool into the abdominal cavity, resulting in sepsis and, eventually, death. I kept reading. After cutting out the tumour, it was not recommended to join the two ends of bowel, particularly in the presence of uphill stool. Because of these two critical findings, the right side of the colon up to the mid-transverse colon should be removed. This meant the surgeon must create an ileostomy on the right side and form a colostomy from the transverse colon. In six weeks, when the emergency had passed and the patient had returned physiologically to normal, a second operation to sew together the two ends of the GI tract would restore bowel continuity. I read and reread the account, forming pictures in my mind. 
And then I volunteered to assist Mr. Hart. Once the patient was asleep, I prepped and draped his belly widely, which formed a huge dome. Mr. Hart pointed to it. Saw that stool and gas accumulated behind the constricting cancer. I agreed. He made a small midline incision into the abdominal cavity. Shit! A big apron of fat had popped out of the incision. The patient was fatter than we both had estimated. Mr. Hart extended the incision so it went from the lower end of the chest to the pubic bone. More fatty tissue attached to loops of air-filled guts floated and spilled out onto the field, liberated from the confinement of the abdominal cavity. Even with my inexperience, I could see this was not going to be an easy operation. As the stress mounted, so did Mr. Hart's chatter. My god, this man is fat. Makes operating so much more difficult. He's a real glutton. Finally, Mr. Hart found the constricting tumor and resected it, including a cuff of large bowel, on either side. I assisted as best I could, all the while feeling that a more experienced helper, such as one of his junior registrars, would have made his task easier. To my surprise, he did not do a right hemicolectomy to remove the accumulated fecaliths, as my textbook recommended. He started to sew the two ends of the large bowel together. I watched in silence, thinking that he must know what he was doing. When he finished, he seemed pleased at the resulting donut-like anastomotic ring where the two ends of the bowel joined. To my eyes, the junction of the two bowels was not that much larger than the original cancer-constricted channel. This was not the recommended operation. Several large fecaliths remained on the right side, which would have to pass through the narrow man-made junction. I pointed to the cannonballs of stool. How are these going to pass through your anastomosis? These are soft stool. They'll just slide through and stretch it. He did not attempt to test his assumption. I had my doubts. Don't you have a 2 p.m. lecture to go to? Why did I say anything in the first place? Hadn't my entire childhood heritage and medical education taught me to stay in my place? Now I had questioned him, making myself vulnerable. I did not argue. Feeling I had transgressed some line of authority, I broke scrub and left theatre. The scrub nurse would assist him with closing the incision. I felt like an idiot as I changed my clothes. I had embarrassed him by questioning his procedure. Perhaps I had not even read about the correct operation. But what he had done defied common sense. I could not see how such large hunks of stool could squeeze through such a narrow and fresh connection. My nerves jangled the rest of the day and didn't settle even by bedtime. For the next couple of days, I did not scrub with Mr. Hart, keeping myself busy with work on the wards. During rounds, I stood at the back of the student crowd and let the ward sister take the lead, while from time to time Mr. Hart glanced at me. Three days later, the patient died. As locum HO, I had to present a thumbnail sketch of his illness to my peers and the other faculty surgeons on the firm who had assembled to watch the lunchtime post-mortem. Mr. Hart did not attend. I limited myself to the patient's history and physical findings, avoiding my interpretation of events during the operation. Professor Smith pointed into the open abdomen and addressed the assembled congregation. The unusually large fecal accretions, bigger than any I've previously seen, could not possibly pass through what I understand from the operative note was a primary anastomosis. Under such circumstances, perhaps in this situation, a standard operation, such as a right hemicolectomy, should have been considered. Hearing him say exactly what I thought brought me no comfort. Should I have been stronger in sharing my thoughts during the operation? I seethed now with fury.
feeling I was complicit in my first patient death. What would have been lost if Mr. Hart and I had discussed my question? He would have had a chance to reassess the situation, thereby preventing the unnecessary death. When I became the operating surgeon one day, I would encourage my students and juniors to question me, and I would make sure to hear them out. The hallmarks of a good surgeon are the three A's. Affability, availability, and ability. My locomacho stint ended with the return of the well-rested unit's house officer. I gladly relinquished care of my surgical patients to him and reverted to the role of medical student. Christmas arrived. Victoria and I joined a group of medical students, including Bowtie with his tuba, and went to Euston and St. Pancras railway stations to sing carols on several evenings. Was Bowtie trying to atone for his hurtful comments? Cold and unable to attract an audience, we disbanded. Despite the cost, I sprang for two tickets to the Christmas ball and rented a dinner jacket with all the accessories. Decked out in my finery, I felt very much the conservative British surgeon, well worth the pretty penny I paid for it. All I was missing was a gold watch and chain. Victoria and I would form a foursome with Rory and his girlfriend. We planned to dance throughout the night and then follow the tradition of breakfasting at 5 a.m. in Covent Garden. The ball was the hospital's premier annual social event. Each year they transformed the enormous library with its polished mahogany flooring into a winter wonderland, complete with seasonal decorations, a huge Christmas tree, and a traditional swing band. Both a Caribbean steel drum group and a classic rock band, each in one squash court, took up residence in the basement. An elegantly adorned refectory served a traditional Christmas meal with champagne. My plans matched those of most medical students attending the ball. Quietly slough off the surgical service in the early afternoon, sleep a few hours, and then get cleaned up for the 8 p.m. evening festivities. Around 11 a.m., though, Mr. Hart sought me out. Would you like to help me with a vascular case? The patient has developed gangrene of his left toes. We'll remove the atheromatous plaque and restore blood flow. It's quite a simple procedure. Shouldn't take very long. I'm starting soon. This put me in a quandary. I had not assisted him after the last surgical disaster. He must have sensed my ambiguous feelings toward him. In about 18 months, though... I planned to ask him for a recommendation to spend my elective period at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, the hospital associated with Harvard. Also, if he were the new professor of the surgical unit replacing Professor Pilcher, I hoped he would select me as the house officer. All right. I went to tell Victoria. And you agreed? I did. But you made plans with me for the Christmas ball. I've never done a vascular surgery. Mr. Hart did his vascular training in Boston, at Massachusetts General Hospital. You know that's where I want to go. How can I be expected to miss this opportunity? But we have tickets. I'll be finished in time for the ball. That is not my point. What is your point? My point is that you made plans with me, and now you're acting as if you didn't. Our plans will be fine. Mr. Hart is applying for the professor's position and needs to be seen, so he'll be going to the ball as well. I went to her and took her in my arms. Doing this surgery with him will help when I come to apply to the surgical house unit job. I know you understand. <sighs> I do. I do. 
Before the start of the case, I read about vascular insufficiency to the limbs and the need for an angiogram x-ray with contrast medium to outline the entire arterial tree from the aorta downwards. The aorta was the main artery going from the heart through the chest and the abdomen to just below the umbilicus where it divided into two iliac arteries, each going down one leg as the iliac which becomes the femoral artery, branching out to supply oxygen and nutrients to the feet and toes. Since I had not learned the anatomy below the knees with Fred, I took the opportunity to acquaint myself with it now. The definitive surgical treatment to improve the inflow of blood to the threatened gangrenous toes was poorly described and beyond my comprehension. Salvaging a threatened limb was an emergency. By early afternoon, I inquired as to when the case would start. I was becoming anxious. None of the OR crew could help me, other than saying the room was ready. I hung around for twenty minutes. No sign of the patient or Mr. Hart. No one on the ward could enlighten me. No one in the X-ray department could assist. I was frustrated. I called Victoria. Come to the operating theatre at eight, and we will leave from there, all right? Why are you not in surgery yet? Just doing some tests before we go in. I'll be ready for the ball at eight, and I have my tux with me here. See you then. <sighs> all right. Finally, I discovered the patient had yet to obtain an angiogram. The radiologist had left to prepare for the ball and was instructing Mr. Hart over the phone how to get a view of the vessels by taking serial x-rays down the leg after injecting contrast. The patient also had to be seen by a cardiologist because of the high frequency of arterial disease affecting the coronary arteries, making him a high-risk candidate for a heart attack while on the operating table. Why hadn't Mr. Hart declared an emergency and mustered all the resources necessary to obtain his help promptly? Was he a surgeon or a pushover? To my dismay, the case finally started around five. If I had not agreed to assist Mr. Hart, I would be back in my dorm getting ready for the ball. As we congregated in the operating room, I was surprised to see no x-rays present. How would Mr. Hart know exactly where the obstruction lay? How would he know where to cut? No angiogram had been obtained. I listened as Mr. Hart argued with the radiologist about obtaining one. It was getting late in the afternoon. The radiologist was already home preparing for the ball. He believed Mr. Hart should delay this procedure for a day. Mr. Hart refused. The radiologist told him to get his own angiogram then. I saw my surprise matched by the anesthetists, as she no doubt would not have put the patient to sleep had she known that x-rays were still to be taken. Neither Mr. Hart nor I had scrubbed as the x-ray technician maneuvered the heavy, portable machine over the anesthetized patient. The first shot was over the upper leg, taken a few seconds after Mr. Hart injected contrast medium into the femoral artery at the groin. The procedure was repeated several times, as x-rays were taken down the leg to the ankle. Armed with the plates, the technician left to develop the films in the basement. Twenty minutes later, we saw the disappointing results. The first film saw the tail of the contrast medium, the second film missed the contrast entirely, while in the third, the contrast left such a weak outline of the vessel that we could barely see it. The whole process had to be repeated. The second batch brought no better results. I see no major constrictions. The obstruction must be higher up. How had he determined this? I didn't dare ask, fearing a humiliating comment. So now we were going to operate on the vascular tree without a roadmap.
Having examined the toes before the patient was anesthetized, I was not that impressed by the degree of dry gangrene on his left three toes. Could this operation not wait a day, even twelve hours, to ensure the necessary pre-op workup had been done and the patient was in optimum condition? What was the hurry? After scrubbing, prepping, and draping the lower abdomen and the limb, he made an abdominal incision to explore the left iliac artery in the pelvis. I glanced at the clock. After six. The iliac vessel was located and visualized. The anesthetist injected the patient with heparin, an anticoagulant, to keep blood from clotting. Mr. Hart placed loops of silk ties above and below the section of the iliac artery that he planned to open, and cinched them to prevent blood loss. I stood opposite him, keeping his visual field clear by sucking up the blood spilling out of the iliac incision. He made an incision, an arteriotomy, into the top of the exposed vessel, through the three layers of its wall, and after I sucked out the spilled blood, we saw its lining. Instead of being smooth as in a healthy artery, it was ragged, diseased with contiguous, soft, buttery yellow-looking atheromatous plaques, which extended circumferentially about the inner lining of the vessel and for the entire exposed section. I could easily imagine how this revolting, fatty stuff narrowed the artery's lumen. Mr. Hart was pleased. This is the site preventing adequate blood flow reaching the toes. He dissected a plane below the cheesy plaques, working on the surface of the middle muscular layer, and scooped out the fatty intima. It was gratifying work, because we were getting rid of the diseased lining, widening the lumen of the vessel so more blood could eventually flow through it. I learned how to do this at Massachusetts General. Seven p.m. As we progressed, it began to seem that the disease process extended both above and below the segment Mr. Hart had cinched. What would happen? We had only cleaned and draped a small area of skin about the incision site, not allowing us to easily extend the skin incision. Mr. Hart, too, began to recognize the seriousness of his predicament. The disease was a systemic process and not the constricting lesion we anticipated that could be tackled and remediated. Excuse me, doctor. A medical student named Victoria is outside dressed for the Christmas ball. She wonders how much longer you will be. Fuck the Christmas ball. We're trying to save a patient's leg. You can't just leave me here alone. We both knew that he required an experienced vascular assistant, not me. Presumably, though, I was all that would be available on this night where everyone else was now gathered downstairs, dancing and enjoying the Christmas celebration. Mr. Hart persisted, bumbling about, searching for solutions to the surgical quandary. The anesthetist suggested several courses of action, which I did not understand and Mr. Hart irritably dismissed. We were trapped. Despite his ongoing efforts, there is no visible improvement to the blood flow to the leg, based on conventional clinical signs of pinking and warming of the foot, or the finding of a bounding pulse at the ankle. The vessel kept clotting off beyond his dissection, despite additional anticoagulants reluctantly given by the anesthetist. Almost nine. Mr. Hart, the anesthetist, and I, along with the support team of nurses, were all fatigued. Why had he not phoned a colleague and asked them to join him or requested an intraoperative consult? Mr. Hart tried again to flush the vessel with blood by loosening the top cinch silk on the iliac artery. Rather than blood flowing, it clotted again. Give more heparin! I've already given him the maximum amount for his body weight. In a last-ditch effort, he passed an intravascular catheter down the leg artery, inflated the balloon with saline, and pulled it back into the arteriotomy wound, retrieving a lot of clots. Next, he injected heparin directly down the vessel in an attempt to prevent further clotting and blockage. Discouraged, he closed the arteriotomy in the iliac artery 
Shortly after ten, he started to close the incisions he had made. Scrub nurse and I can close the wound. Why don't you go? I reluctantly left the theater. I was amazed to find Victoria still waiting outside. I'm sorry you had to wait this long. How did it go? You must be exhausted, my darling. I am, but I'm more angry that we didn't start until five. And he couldn't get an angiogram and then... Never mind. It's over now. Let me get cleaned up and we'll be on our way. We met up with Rory and his girlfriend in the library. Rory and I bought drinks for the four of us and ascended to the catwalk, wrapping the upper parts of the library. We admired the beautiful Christmas decorations that transformed the library, enhanced by falling snow outside, and the graceful couples in holiday finery waltzing to the orchestra on the library floor below. Too tired to consume alcohol, I pulled out two old books. I slid my champagne glass deep into the recess of the bookshelf and replaced the volumes. I would have enjoyed going down to the other squash courts in the basement to dance to the fast and loud beat of the guitar-shrieking band playing the Beatles and Rolling Stones and vent my frustration at another failed operation. Except I was weary, and Victoria was too self-conscious for that kind of dancing. I heard via the grapevine that the patient's toes were ultimately amputated. The experience taught me a lot, not the least of which is that I had somehow managed to fall in love with the most suitable mate a future surgeon could dream of. You've been listening to Making the Cut from 1C Productions. Making the Cut was written, produced, and directed by Rebecca Seitz, based on Michael McGeed's manuscript, Mastering the Knife. Noah James played Michael McGeed. Other roles were brought to life by the voice talent of Oliver Coppert, Nicola Waldron, Jackie Weiner, Steve Jobson, and Victoria Wickham. Audio engineering provided by Zischer LLC. Making the Cut theme music by Kyle J. Baker. Learn more at makingthecutpodcast.com.